Hi, welcome to More Christ. This is a channel dedicated to Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox alike. I'm delighted to be joined once again by the incomparable Dr. Jared Casey. Uh, Jared is an Irish philosopher and a professor emeritus at University College Dublin. Today, we'll discuss his phenomenal book, Freedom's Progress. So we've spoken a bit about this brilliant book before, Jared, but um, I would love to really get into some of your arguments today and some of the key points. Just to begin, could you tell us again what uh, is the basic outline of the book and what makes this one distinct from others out there? Okay, I'll do my best, uh, Mark, and thank you very much, by the way, for having me on. It's great, it's great to see you again, and uh, and always, uh, you know, I mean, anyone who knows me knows that the worst thing you could possibly do is invite me to speak, <laughs> and then uh, then you have to try and get me to shut up. But anyway, so uh, yeah, the book, what's it about? Well, you know, there are many um, histories of philosophy and many histories, quite a few actually, of political philosophy, and and they all have merit. I mean. Um, so why another one? Why do another one? And the answer is, as, you, as somebody once said, uh, the short answer is the phone rang. No, uh, I was asked. <laughs> okay, but then I had to think. Well, what do I do? Do I just kind of repeat the dose? Do I just kind of give my own take on the the sort of usual suspects? Um, you know, Plato and Aristotle and Machiavelli and Hobbes and Locke and Hume and all of the rest. Uh, and in a way, you have to because these are sort of standard. Um, core elements of uh, pe people who have written in political philosophy. But I thought, well, okay, that that's, you know, that's a respectable enough undertaking. You could do worse things. You'd be out drinking in the pub, for example. <laughs> Not that you can do it these days, but anyway. <laughs> so I thought, well, what's, what's my sort of angle on this? What, like, what's my point, as it were? And I thought, well, you know, I'm a libertarian, okay? I believe that freedom is, you know, the most basic um, value that we have without which our actions have no merit and we can't accept responsibility. I don't think it's the only thing, obviously, because otherwise friendship and love and all of the other good things wouldn't matter, but they do. But I just mean it's basic. And therefore I thought, well, how about if I were to, as it were, trace the idea of freedom uh, from the earliest possible times up to now and kind of give a health check <laughs> on it. Now, there's all sorts of dangers that arise with this. One is that there's a danger of anachronism, which is of assuming that the whatever it is that the concept of freedom or liberty applies to has been the same throughout all of the ages. Uh, I don't think that's the case, but and I don't think I make that mistake. But there have to be some, if you like, elements or parts of it that are continuous. Uh, and so that's the that's the first way in which my account I think differs from many. So it's a, it's a kind of history of freedom, hence the name, freedom's progress. Mm -hmm. And the question mark is important, not just because I'm kind of weird and like putting in <laughs> random <laughs> random uh, marks, but it's just that um, you could you could present an argument, as it were, that we started off in some kind of I don't know slavery or bondage. And every day, in every way, we've been getting freer and freer and freer. And now we've reached the apogee and it's going to get better from now on. And I, I think that's false, right? Um, so did I take the other thing? I mean, did I think we started off in some kind of glorious freedom, more or less like, you know, Rousseau in some versions uh, seems to think. And we've kind of, you know, we've come down into some state of bondage. And the answer is no, it's neither of those. So I think the history of freedom is a kind of up and down, backwards and forwards, progress and regress. And that's what the question mark is doing in there. So that's the first point then, right? So it's it's kind of a political history from the viewpoint of freedom. The second one is, is I think uh, I deal with in my introduction and it's this, um, philosophers, <laughs> philosophers have an exaggerated idea of their importance in the scheme of things. <laughs> not, not true in my case, because I'm supremely important, obviously, but <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? They tend to think that they're the kind of bee's knees when it comes to thinking about things and so on. So so there's a tendency towards, if you like, having sort of swelled heads here. But when, when it comes to actually what happens in the world, um, philosophers do make contributions, right? But they are also reacting to what goes on in the world around them. So it's a dialectical <coughs> situation. <clears throat> so the history of political philosophy is not something that's created out of the top of their heads by philosophers uh, to whom the rest of the world is incredibly grateful for allowing them to participate 
<laughs> in existence. This is not the way in which it works. Um, it's rather that the, the people live together and have to organize their affairs and, and deal with one another and deal with people from other, uh, other cultures and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and then they reflect on their actions and their behavior and that changes and philosophers are part of that reflective process. Not perhaps as all important as they might think they are, but they do make a contribution. So what I've tried to do, in a, so apart from tracing the concept of liberty, as it were, from the earliest possible times up to the present, I've also tried to situate uh, the thinking of the philosophers I deal with in their historical context. And therefore, you know, so I have a big preamble where I talk about the kind of prehistory, and then, you know, I do Plato and Aristotle, but then I talk about slavery. So, as it were, if you think of the dealings with the philosophers as a kind of a sort of a narrow line or a thread running through, every so often I kind of branch out. So I look at sort of slavery. I have a chapter on Christianity. Uh, I have a chapter on the English Revolution. I have a chapter on the new, I can't even remember what it is now, um, but you know what I mean? So every so often I, I branch out, if you like to look at the social, I have, I have a chapter on the institutions of the middle ages, the universities, uh, the cities uh, and so on. Because I think that's really important. I think one of the failings of, of philosophers generally uh, is that they really don't have a sufficient, still less a sufficiently nuanced appreciation of history. Mm -hmm. uh, I get this by the way from my teaching because one of the things, one of the, biggest shocks I got when I when I began teaching 100 million years ago or that's what it seems like <laughs> was I am um, I was teaching a course I was at the University of Notre Dame and I was teaching a course in the, the philosophy and theology of history and I was in the middle of of a, a lecture and I was talking about church councils and you know when you're a teacher you've been a teacher okay so you're familiar with this and those who are anyone view, looking in are listening foolish people <laughs> those people looking listening who are teachers or however taught will know this phenomenon you will see a little kind of great come down over your students eyes when you know they're not getting it yeah okay there you know you're not hitting not only you're not hitting on all cylinders you're not hitting on any cylinder <laughs> okay and so and and, and so you got to look out for that and you got to think and i kind of back up the truck as it were and kind of wonder what's going on so so I then said, uh, I can't remember which counselor I was talking about, but uh, so this is a, a, obviously a Catholic, a Catholic university. So I said, um, so hang on a second, how many, um, how many ecumenical councils have there been For, from a Catholic perspective? Because obviously there are different perspectives, but from a Catholic perspective, how many are there? Now, all of these students or most of them had, had were the product of Catholic schools and uh, were at the top of their class. You have to be really like bright, you know, to get into Notre Dame. And they knew, of course, that there was a Vatican II. So they figured, because they're smart, they had to be a Vatican I. <laughs> so one is not the correct answer, right? <laughs> okay. So it's at least two. But I got, uh, so I, I got people to write down their answers. And I, they said like two, seven, nine, you know, I got 25, whatever, whatever. Like, and I said, by the way, excluding the Council of Jerusalem, if that's what you wanted to, to consider one, but leave that aside. Anyway, the only one who got the answer correct, and it was only one, was a Lutheran. She was a Lutheran. She wasn't Catholic. Okay, <laughs> she got it right. And then I, and then I said, okay. Um, so leaving aside, as I said, the Council of Jerusalem, roughly how many years after the birth of Christ <clears throat> and taking the conventional zero figure for the birth of Christ, how many years approximately to the nearest, you know, 20, 25 uh, was the first general council? Was it 20 years, 60, 100, 200, 700, 1000? And again, I got answers all over the place. You know, everyone was singing. And I said, well, actually, it's, it was over 300 years, 320, whatever the, the, the right answer is, 25, I think. Um, and I said, you know, that's as far distant historically from the birth of our Savior as you are from 
the founder, in fact, from the foundation of is in the United States of the United States. That's a long time, right? So then I discovered what I call the the um, backdrop theory of history, which is that most students have an idea, obviously, of what has happened in their own lifetime. So you can go back, say, 18, 20 years, right? So, you know, you get, get, you get that kind of depth. Yeah. And then from hearing their parents, and if they're lucky, their grandparents talk, they get an additional few years, right? And then certain events, obviously, they even even students today can't be ignored of completely, even though they may not know when it, when they happen, like Second World War, for example, only be surprised at the, at the dates they give you, right? And then, so that, that kind of goes back as it were, right? And then suddenly everything goes flat. And that's what I mean by the backdrop. And then, then everything is like, you know, like in the, in the theater where you have a backdrop and everything's painted on it. So you've got wars and you've got knights and armor and bowmen and oh, pilgrim fathers and Ottoman Turks and God only knows what, all mixed up together. Mm -hmm. I really had no idea. So one of the things I had to do in, in my lectures was to try and give them some idea of history, some idea of just how far these go back and how different things are. And then the other thing I wanted to get across from them, <laughs> this is going to seem so obvious as, as to be embarrassing. I said, um, do you know that say 300, 300, 350 years ago, the idea of having a political structure that wasn't organized around a king or a duke or a single person was almost unthinkable. Okay, if you had said to people at that stage that there would be political structures where this wasn't the case in the way in which they understood it, they would have been completely baffled. They would have thought, like, you're crazy. And, and so to people at that time, the situation we're in now was literally unimaginable. Okay, you say, well, okay, fine. I mean, that's obvious, but hang on a second. This is implications. Because of course, if that was the case for people, you're going, you see where I'm going on this one, right? If that was the case for people back then, why should we think that we are the apogee of history? That, that not only are things the way they are, because manifestly they are, even if we might argue about it, okay? But there's no reason to think that in 300 years or 200 years or 100 or even 50, that they will actually be the way they are now. And in fact, if history is anything to go by, I put my money on things being very different. Right? Mm -hmm. So I was trying to soften them up as it were, trying, trying to get them a, to appreciate history, but also to grasp the fact that <laughs> the basic fact of history, which is things change, have always changed and will always change. And therefore, I, I call that the doctrine of presentism. In other words, presentism is a doctrine that not only are things the way they are, but they must be. They cannot be any other way. Yeah. And so that's, so that's a, long, a long answer to your question. So that's one of the reasons why I wrote the history the way I did, the history of the concept of freedom, the fact that it's up and down, the fact that it takes an enormous span of time, but also to get students to appreciate that where we're going into the future, no one knows. And that's another function of that question mark in, uh, in my title. So there we are. I bet you're sorry you asked that question now. Hey, no, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Jared. Very important. <laughs> I think especially in light of um, the new COVID-19 fiasco and all the things that come with it, the lockdowns, this seemingly arbitrary dictation that we're receiving and everything. Um, would you like to speak to that a little bit and um, how that ties in with our understanding of the nature and history of freedom? Well, the, the first and most obvious one, I mean, we, we've been, anyone who thinks that we have rights where rights mean the, the ability to do or not to do certain things, regardless of circumstances, cannot but, if you like, have received a slap across the face. Because, in other words, we've suddenly realized that the, the most sort of elementary things that we took for granted the ability to get uh, to get on a bus, go into town, have a meal, meet our friends, chat, organize a party, get married, invite our friends. All of these. I mean, what, what are these like kind of madly extravagant things? <laughs> OK, OK. No, all of these ordinary things can be curtailed and curtailed, not 
I mean, I mean, okay, well, you can understand there might be circumstances in which there is a sort of uh, a present, as it were, danger to which the only reaction is, as it were, to step on the brake. But nine months later, we've stepped on the brake, we've stepped on the brake, and now we're stepping on the brake again. And there's, there seems to be sort of no plan. So what, what, what are we going to be doing? Locking down until 2047? I mean, if you know what the plan is, would you mind telling me? Because I don't know what the plan is, right? <laughs> it's extraordinary. And it also shows something about our culture, which is that we have a very sort of strange idea of the condition of human living, which is that somehow it is meant to be risk free okay and and so that any our liberties can be curtailed in the most draconian fashion if there's any danger at all now i'm not downplaying the, the, the fact that covid19 is serious and by the way people it's serious for people of my age okay it's almost has very little danger, it seems, for people uh, 45 to 65 and almost none for people under that, right? The death rates are, are insignificant. Obviously, any death is significant for those, the family and, and the person involved, but it's statistically and so on. So it is quite extraordinary that this, we, the governments have, and by the way, the interesting thing from a libertarian point of view is that they are doing it, broadly speaking, with the support of their population. I mean, it's not that there have been riots and so on protesting against this. Some few people have done it. But by and large, when these restrictions have been imposed and they conduct a poll, now that's assumed, by the way, that the polls are, are accurate, <laughs> they, the polls tend to find that, more, that quite a significant number of people say, we should actually do more. <laughs> we should do greater restrictions and for longer. And that actually uh, undermines or underlines point that I make, I think, in Freedom's Progress, which is that people value security much more than they value liberty. Mm -hmm. And they are prepared to tolerate and indeed to let go of their liberties for security. All you need to do to get people to, to do whatever you want is to, is to call up some kind of scare. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, that this is some kind of conspiracy and so on and so forth. I, I, I'm, I think in, in many cases, we don't quite know what the danger is and the figures um, don't seem to justify the extraordinary measures that are being taken, not to mention the collateral damage which has been done to our economy, which, by the way, has knock-on effects um, on other things. So people, for example, people trying to get uh, treatment for other illnesses, cancer or whatever it might be, or scheduled operations, all of these things. And so there seems to be no sense here of a trade-off. And so one of the basic things that we know from economics is that in life, it's always a trade-off. I mean, you know, crossing a road involves a certain amount of danger. Okay, there's certain ways to do it that minimize that. One is to keep your eyes open and look at the traffic. The most exciting one, of course, is to wear a blindfold and cross at random. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's, leave it up to you which one you want to do. I, I recommend the former which is actually looking to see what happens but but despite your best endeavor you know uh something could happen you could trip and fall you you could misjudge the 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 speed of a car the, the car coming towards you could lose control god only knows what i was driving actually it was going to my son's wedding the other day and i was going up uh, barrow street in in town on my way and they're building there on they're doing uh converting bull and smells and i noticed that high above the thing, the, one of the cranes had this mass of concrete uh, struts just sitting there right over the street, okay? And I was looking up and I'm thinking, I'm not gonna hang around here. So I kind of slow down until I waited for the traffic to clear in front of me. And then I belted across, <laughs> okay? Now, you know, the chances of anything happening are kind of slim, but if they did, I wouldn't be going to a wedding, <laughs> okay? So yeah, it, 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 we live in extraordinary times. And if ever um, we thought that we lived in the best of all possible worlds and things could only get better and better and that our freedoms were guaranteed and we were permanently secure against various threats, food shortages or transport uh, well, you know, limitations or health, uh, we were permanently guaranteed to be free from bugs forever. I'm just thinking, no, no, we, we know now, if we didn't know before uh, mm. that that's not the case. Chances are, by the way, that if we do get back to normal, which I hope we do, and soon, we will put, we will relapse into a state of complacency again, right? But I, I am absolutely, as a libertarian, shocked, absolutely horrified 
by the compliance, by the complacency, by the willingness of the mass of my fellow citizens and indeed uh, people in other countries as well, just to live with these horrific uh, restrictions based on quite what I do not know. Mm -hmm. right? yep. uh, so there's a lesson there for all of us. Yep. And as I said to you at the start before we came on air, if I if I hadn't been a libertarian anarchist already, this would have made me one. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> Unfortunately, important yeah. points there. And um, I think too that it's not as if there's there aren't models that seem to be working all right. That um, seems to me, I don't know if this is right, but Sweden, for example, is like the giant elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about, and their approach, which didn't require the same draconian measures but doesn't have a disproportionately high um rate of deaths and so forth is that right well yes i mean okay the the you, you know depending on what you read and the source you go to you get different stories and sweden i find it kind of ironic and amusing that sweden which has been a poster <laughs> boy for everything that was good and wonderful and so on and, and we were all held up to shame against it suddenly became the bad boy because they were doing things in a certain way now they have brought in they have had restrictions and and they have brought in some but they haven't been as draconian or as far reaching, uh, I think. I'm correct in saying that. I, I'm open to, to correction if I'm not. Um, uh, you know, to, to, look, to be frank here, uh, no matter what we did, there were, there were going to be problems. Okay, there's, there's, there's no perfect solution. I mean, somebody once said that the best is the enemy of the good. And so when you're faced with, with choices, if one is clearly the best and outstanding and everything else is rubbish, then you don't really have a choice. You, you just do the best. But very often in life, you have to make choices, right? And the, the Swedes seem to have made a choice to try and minimize the damage to their economy, recognizing not this is not just a matter of money or income or anything, but in fact, it affects the whole life of their society and the health of people and so on and so forth, and to try and, 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 and minimize the restrictions on freedoms and so on. So there are different ways. I mean, clearly, there are some, if, again, if we are to believe uh, what we're told, certain sections of the uh, population are at risk in a way that others aren't. So, for example, when you get people over 65 into ICU with COVID, the death rate is about 100%. <laughs> okay, yes, that's it. But when you come down to the 45 to 65, it, it reduces dramatically and I'm going from memory here so again you know I don't want anybody yelling at you that I got the figures <laughs> wrong but I think it's something like three percent okay and when you get under that it's practically zero okay uh, so that would seem to suggest that however difficult it might be to do it the most sensible way to try and approach it would be in a targeted fashion in other words uh, and so you give people the you ask people to take personal responsibility for their own health, which, by the way, one would assume is something they should be doing anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, look, you know, in, in, before we ever had this, this COVID-19 hanging around uh, in the winter, we all know that, that colds and flus go around, right? So if you're susceptible, if you're knocked out by these things, and the flu is serious, by the way, the cold is, is not so serious, but it knocks, it, well, I don't know what it does to you, but it knocks me out for two weeks which, you know, so I'm going around feeling like death warmed over and then I'm incredibly grumpy. No, people say, how would you know the difference? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, uh, and so on. So yeah, uh, so in the winter, I mean, you know, I, I would prefer and have always suggested when people, I love people coming to see me, but if they have colds, I, I don't really want them to come into the house. I'm not antisocial, I just that I don't want them to give me a cold. That's not unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And when I'm on public transport, I've been doing this for years because I learned this when I was uh, when I was first at UC, UCD. I used to pick up like eight or ten colds a year because I was on public transport. So long before COVID came along, when I was on public transport, if I'm on the dart or on the buses, I, I try never to touch the surface. Yeah. And I try never to sit anywhere where anybody's sniffling or coughing or hacking. If they're doing it in a, in a thing, I would move into another carriage. Okay. I would open the, the doors with my elbow, um, you know, and I would wash my hands frequently as one should do anyway. All of these things are sort of normal, right? Uh, try not to like breathe into somebody's face and six inches away from them. Okay. And yeah, so there are sensible things that we could all do. And then again, from the point of view, say, of especially of vendors or businesses, it seems to me that, again, from a libertarian perspective, it's really up to them to decide whether they want to open, and if so, how they want to operate what they're doing. So I'll give you an example here. Um, 
I had some problems with my back in November. When you have about six hours to spare, I'll go into the details. <laughs> but but I, so I, I ended up having uh, some medical treatment and some x-rays, but then I went for physio. And in the physios, um, the one of the things they did, apart from having me fill out a questionnaire saying, you know, where I'd been and all of that, which is perfectly reasonable, they I took my temperature, right? And indeed, when I went to my son's wedding in a hotel at the weekend, they took the temperature, right? So anybody whose temperature was above a certain thing would not be allowed in. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's entirely the right thing to do. So there's nothing to stop, for example, say Brown Thomas uh, in you know in town um, in Grafton Street, uh, using some system or a similar system, uh, you know, doing temperature checks or allowing only a certain number in their store or whatever. Uh, it's entirely their business if they want to do it. It's entirely my business and, and the business of other consumers whether they want to actually go into the store and take the risk. There is nothing that is completely risk-free in this life, but you can minimize it, you can be sensible. I mean, the shop next door, I don't know who they are, I don't want to malign them, okay? Who might have a more kind of, you know, they say fair approach, you know, we take anybody or whatever and so on. But it would make sense for people to use, you know, their own criteria and make their own judgments. And which is what, for example, when the restaurants were open, uh, which is what they were doing. Uh, I, I, about most five or six weeks ago, I had lunch with my son in town during the previous kind of lifting of a lockdown. And uh, the restaurant we were in, which was in former times, basically people were sitting on top of each other's laps, had been spaced out. You were more than two meters apart. Uh, the staff were all wearing their, their gear and so on. And people were having their lunch and taking their masks off when they're having their lunch and leaving and, and uh, you know, do, doing the, what is it, the wipes of the hand with the, the alcohol and all of that stuff. And that seemed to be working perfectly well. But apparently, you see, we're not adult enough to be trusted to behave sensibly. Because as you and I both know, the mass of human beings are incredibly stupid and, and will, will do really, really silly things unless their lords and masters organize their life for them. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, unfortunately. Yes. So unfortunately. Exactly. So. Yeah. So there we are. So so that's kind of kind of we could talk about. I mean, we know. I mean, I'm sure everybody's sick of this and so on. But I mean, this simply cannot go on. This foolishness really has to stop. Um, there doesn't seem to be any plan. Uh, I mean, we cannot. How long? I mean, uh, I, I I'm going to send you a little video I did um, called COVID-19 and the Canute Courtiers Complex. So you can link it to the to your own if you like, and people can see. What, what I'm doing there is I'm giving an account of the two letters I wrote to, to uh, both to Leo Bradker and Michal Martin, the former and the current T-shirt, asking them not to do the things that they were doing and pointing out the dangers and so on, and then asking what happens. Right, this is back in March of this year, right? Just to make sure. So it's, it's easy to be wise after the event, and saying, uh, and letters I wrote to the Irish Times where I said, well, what happens, you know, if the COVID comes around again, or we get another thing, do we close down again? And again, and again, yeah. right? just asking how often can we close down before we all die from starvation? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so that should be a bit of fun. Anyway, let's 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 move on to something more uplifting. <laughs> no, thank you, George. So um, I think I think that sort of sets up us up well because it's points to the fact, I guess, of there being nothing new under under the sun, as the Bible talks about. So in your book, you obviously go through the whole panoply of history well as much as you can um so i want to go back to early history what has your work taught you about early man the role of events such as the agricultural revolution and the formation of law well yeah i mean again now when you're talking about prehistory as i point out in the book it's important to remember what you're talking about pre history. <laughs> so it involves a fair amount of speculation and therefore uh, it's easy to be dogmatic without uh, fear of as it were of contradiction. <laughs> um, so, we, but uh, I, I, so, but I mean, I, I went to the most reputable sources I could find to give me the kind of story uh, here. So human beings have been around for quite some time, depending on how you look at it in their current form for at least 200,000 years and probably longer. I mean, we know we go way back, but you know, Homo sapiens and so on. And which means that human beings have been living uh, together, uh, uh, procreating and making a living, finding food uh, and, get, and you know, doing all of the normal things that people do. Um, the really interesting thing, of course, is they've been doing this for most of this time without anything like a government as we would understand it. <laughs> That's the first 
and I think most interesting thing. Mm -hmm. right? So if the idea, you know, for many people, when you see, when you talk about anarchism and, and you get over their initial fear that it simply means like, you know, people, mad people running through the street with machetes, killing each other and, and so on. And, you know, a love for disorder and chaos. And you, you mean, say it means not being ruled from above, as it were, uh, by a ruler. Um, then they say, well, well, how does, how did this work? Well, the earliest groups, so far as we could tell, were not so much family groups, because a family group is hardly self-sufficient, but but a like collections of families, probably most often than not related to one another. And here, um, you can even find this, by the way, in recent history. So, for example, in many of the Indian tribes in the USA or Native American, if you prefer that term, um, would have been puzzled if somebody had come to them and said, "Take me to your leader." Because not because they wouldn't understand the question because it was asked in English and they didn't speak it, but because they didn't understand the concept of a leader. Okay, what they did understand was that in certain that, for example, if war needed to be made, then somebody who was and who had expertise in this area would say, "I'm going off to do this." Anybody who wants to, can join me and go, and therefore he became the de facto leader. But you know, when he returned. He didn't have any political power. Uh, that was it. I mean, just went back to doing what he was doing. A bit like Cincinnatus with his plow. I mean, in the early Roman Republic, Cincinnatus again took up arms and led the Roman army. And when it was finished, he went back to his farm. <laughs> okay. So human beings and the earliest human beings have lived together in groups without any formal political structure that we would recognize where there's, if you like, some kind of authoritative figure um, who could give orders or commands that had to be had to be uh, obeyed on kind of penalty. And here you need to make a distinction between, and I, I make it in the book, between authority of office and authority of expertise. And these are often mixed up. So let me give you an example. Um, when you're not feeling so well, right, um, you will, if you can, <laughs> get to see a doctor. And the doctor will say, mm, okay, look at you, poke you and do all of the various things and say, yes, it's such and such a thing. You need to do this or take this. Here's a prescription, take this three times a day and so on. Um, so when you leave the office, what happens the next day if you haven't taken your medicine? Does the doctor arrive at your door, okay, with two armed goons, okay, and hold you down and shove the medicine down your throat? And the answer is no, no. What you've done is you've gone to somebody whom you think or believe to have an expertise that you don't have. He makes what is effectively a recommendation. It's entirely up to you whether you follow that. Sometimes, and as a matter of fact, uh, in really serious cases where you get an opinion from a doctor and the, you know, what's recommended is fairly drastic, it's quite common to get a second opinion. And others, another independent opinion to vary to. And if the guy comes up with exactly the same story, then you think, okay, fine. If, if they're not in cahoots, chances are that they've got it right. But if the second opinion is very different, then you're not going to do it. But by and large, where you're looking, where you are, where there is an authoritative figure, somebody who knows things that you don't know, the sensible thing to do is to ask his advice and follow it. The same is true, by the way, in more, more mundane things. For example, if your car doesn't work, you, you know, you take it to a reliable mechanic, okay? And generally you ask around, okay? So somebody, you know, isn't too expensive and doesn't rip you off and does a good job and does it in time. And you take it along and he says, and he's, he, he makes some kind of mystic incantation about what's wrong with it. You haven't got a clue. Okay, and you, what, what are you supposed to do? You say, well, yeah, go ahead and do it. And if he gives you the car and it's now fixed and running, you figure, well, he probably knew what he was doing, okay? So that's authority of expertise. But for example, if a police officer stops you on the street, right, it's not because he has superior knowledge to you, that he knows something you don't know. It's because he's been given a certain kind of an authority by another figure, and he has powers which no other person has to interfere with your progress through the city in a way, you know, so if some random person walks out into the street and holds up his hand and wants to inspect your car, 
you're going to you're going to say something which would be very impolite i imagine at least i would yeah. okay but this guy in a uniform does it and so on so that's authority of office and authority of expertise so in primitive in you know in 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 I don't want to say primitive in any bad sense, but you know, in, in early societies, clearly you would have authority of expertise. Whether they actually had the expertise or not isn't really the question. It's whether or not they are they are believed to have it. Okay. So um, I, in when I was a student, I was very interested in anthropology, which is not really taught in any Irish university, but I read it on my own. And I remember reading all two volumes of E. Evans Pritchard's book. Witchcraft, Oracle, and Magic among the Azandi. And it's an extraordinary complex thing. But the Azandi have a, uh, it's a tribe in Africa, and they have a belief that if bad things happen to anybody, it's because somebody else brought it about. See, accidents don't happen. So if you, if you trip over a log and break your leg, it's because somebody did something. They put a spell on you or they did something, right? So now we have a problem. We have to figure out who was it, who it was that had it in for you, right? So you go to see the, the local expert in the tribe and he does various things. One of which, by the way, involves giving, involves giving poison to a chicken. You think, what? And the answer is, well, see, the poison is intermittent. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the chicken lives and sometimes the chicken dies. I mean, you could flip a coin and get the same thing, right? And so in any event, the, when you've done this, um, the, the expert will say, yes, it's because your next door neighbor put a spell on you. And then they, then they drag in the next door neighbor. And here's the interesting thing. Because he's part of this culture system, he buys into it in exactly the same way that everybody else does. And he thinks, oh, crikey, I don't remember doing it, but I must have done it. And so on and so forth. And then eventually everything is organized and compensation is paid and, and, and all of the upset is dealt with, right? So, you know, that's, Kind of like how it works in that same he, because he's deemed to be a particular expert whether we would agree with it or not from the outside is irrelevant yeah. it doesn't make any difference right so uh these tribes these basic units of society would have made use of authority of expertise insofar as they deemed people to have it but not authority of office for the most part and so we come to the interesting thing so this must have been the situation for human beings for almost all of our history it's really interesting to think that for almost all of our history, human beings probably lived in groups that did not exceed probably 150 or 200 people. Right? And enough to allow, if you like, for genetic uh, variation and, and avoiding inbreeding and, and so on and so forth, allowing for the occasional interaction with other groups and so on and so on. But yeah, that would be about it. And no political structures, no states. And so, on. Yeah. so how are they making a living at this stage? Well, they're hunting and gathering. That is to say, the, the, uh, they are chasing animals, uh, trapping them, and, and, uh, and, and they are, as they were, wandering around, picking what they can from bushes and, and from you know, stuff that they find, right? And in order to do this, you have to move, right? You have to follow your game. Um, and needless to say, once you arrive in a place to start uh, killing the animals, the, the word goes around and the animals tend to move. <laughs> okay. Also, you know, there, there's a limit to how many berries you can pick off a bush okay, before you've exhausted the bush and you need to move. So, yeah, and this is what they did. So the, re the first breakthrough was the agricultural revolution. And it was the idea that instead of, as it were, chasing after your animals, you could actually hang on to them, capture them and have them breed as it were, and then live off the animals, keeping a stock of animals permanently in place so that you don't have to chase them. And the other, so that, that replaces hunting by and large, right? And then the gathering business is you suddenly realize, well, hang on a second, we just don't have to pick berries off a bush. We can actually, uh, you know, break up the ground and put stuff in and lo and behold, we get stuff and we can tell more or less reliably that, you know, if we put certain grasses here, we get certain seeds and, you know, we can then crush them and we can make bread and so on and so forth. So that's a huge change because now instead of wandering all over the place, you, you're in one place. But here's the other thing. Your productivity has increased dramatically. Right. When you do this, OK, uh, you now control. Now, obviously, there are vagaries here because weather and storms and that and that harvest can you know wipe you out but by and large you can within the vagaries of nature control your food supply and you can also produce much more than you need any one time 
And once you do that, once you have a surplus, okay, then that tends to produce people, since not everybody has to work at, you know, chasing the game and picking the berries, it means that you could, you have room for, for leisure and room for people to develop um, areas of expertise. For example, you have, you can have priests, okay, who can take, be permanently employed and supported by the community from the surplus in the community, right? Um, and also, instead of every person in the group as it were, having the responsibility for defense against attacks, say, by another group, you can actually afford to maintain a permanent group of people whose job it is to do that precisely and who develop an expertise in it, pick the big, really strong guys, and so on and so forth, right? So mm -hmm. begin to see how this works. Now, once you do this, what essentially was an egalitarian society, okay, not because they were like, 20th century egalitarian is always yeah. a good idea, but just as just as a matter of fact, right? Suddenly there's an there's an horizontal dimension, right? And then you have so you have the surplus of, of wealth, surplus of food and food supplies. And then so you get people who are developing sort of expertise, particularly in defense. And what tended to happen then was that the groups got larger. Because you have more food, you can you can support many more people. And when you go beyond the 150 or 200 people, then the, the, the social structures that held that in place no longer tend to work. You tend not to know everybody. Ask yourself, by the way, how many people do you know really, really well? And that's a real question. Yeah. I mean, you know your, your immediate family, you care your friends, but like, do you know, do you know a thousand people really well? Not even how so. about 500? <laughs> 200? 100? 50? You see, it's, it's just not possible. Yep. Okay, I mean, you know, so so it tends not to work, and so I mean, I don't want to get into the big story here, but that, but that, what tends to happen then is that those people who have who have um, an authority of expertise, particularly in defense, okay, are very useful, obviously, uh, uh, in defending you against attack, but also, by the way, in leading attacks on other groups, because one of the one of the most basic ways in which human beings have made livings over time is by stealing other people's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, after all, if some other idiot is willing to work hard and, and, and make all this stuff and you can you can go and kill him and steal it. Well, hey, that saves all the work. I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious, obviously. But just in case, by the way, you think that this is something, again, that's prehistoric. Remember that cattle raiding was something that was carried on along the border between Scotland and England up to the 18th century. And the interesting thing was, in other words, so you would have like a Scots group who would, uh, a group of Scotsmen who would go over the border and steal the English cattle. And when they brought it back, not only were they not condemned, not only did people go, not go, tut, tut, that's terrible. They went, great, terrific, more cattle for us. And, you know, damn those Englishmen, right? And when some Englishmen went over the border and stole some Scotsmen cattle, they got exactly the same thing. So, so if you like predation by one group against another, has been a favorite human occupation. And once, see, once you have a surplus that can be stolen, that can be taken from you, you need to defend it, okay? And therefore you can see the beginnings of a permanent defense force. But once people, there's a, there's a double edge to this because these people can defend you against others, but what's, how are you going to be defended against them? Okay. Yeah. And that really is how politics, how the verticality, gets into our political structures. So that the defenders become permanent and they are the ones then who determine how the food, how the excess food supplies and wealth of the society is to be organized. That's, that's really the sort of radical moment. And that's the great shift. That's one thing that Rousseau does think, by the way. Um, and I think he's correct in this. He thinks that the beginnings of human slavery and, and, and subjection lies, he thinks, in agriculture. And when you look at you, well, what? He's talking about agriculture, no, but he means he's kind of making the point that I've been making here, which is that you have the surplus of wealth, you have specialization, and then you have the emergence, if you like, of a, of a military class, okay, and then the military leader tends to become the political ruler, and that tends to become sort of hereditary or passed on from one group to the other and becomes a permanent feature of society. Anyway, that's just a quick overview. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Jared. I want to ask you next how that... Um what continuities and discontinuities maybe there are between that 
historical development and how we tell the story as it were. So I want to know how, how modern origin stories and our conception of freedom today um, plan out and thinking especially about people like Rousseau, who you mentioned, and Thomas Hobbes, and the way they describe the state of nature and so on, and how that um, conditions us to think now. Can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, yeah, well, okay, the, the, the first point I want to make, and, and it's really a theme that runs th through my book, is that, again, for much of human history, the idea of the individual was at best latent right? Human beings tended to think of themselves and of other people as part of a group or part of a tribe, right? The individuality was not, if you like, high on anyone's agenda. Mm -hmm. And the, so, so you were expect, it, it, so this is really, this is a, this is very difficult for us to conceive of because for us, uh, individuality and individualism and the, and the worth of the individual is something that is so sort of second nature to us now that we we find it difficult to grasp just how historically contingent it is and how it actually has emerged slowly and fitfully from a context of groupthink. And by the way, again, just as <laughs> just when I was talking about the the cattle raiding and showing how, if you like, predation of one group and another has survived even you know, up to the historical, you know, recent history. Uh, it's also the case that when even 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 now, if you like, after we've kind of grasped uh, the idea of the individual and the worth of the individual, human beings have a tendency to relapse under pressure into groups or tribes. Uh, whatever they may we may not call them that okay and there's nothing exotic and we're not talking about feathers or fancy war paint or anything like that but nonetheless it's like form we think we tend to think of ourselves as members of groups now there's a certain truth in that right to be what you are uh, even as an individual is to have a connection to groups of various kinds okay you are born in a certain place and that if you like characterizes you uh, whether you like it or not even if only by reaction you know, even if you don't want to be from there, in a sense, you are from there and your rejection of it is, in a sense, conditioned by your having been from there in the first place. So all of that's true. And we've seen that we see this, by the way, and this is this is uh, this is very much current at the moment, because what has emerged in the last five years or so is identity politics, where the idea to me, which is to somebody like me, which is shocking that that we should relate to people fundamentally uh, because of their membership of certain groups, okay, whether that's a group based on skin color or their sex or whatever it might be, and that's by and, and that's how we do it, and that takes precedence over uh, individuals. And I'm going, oh, guys, <laughs> I've always sorted all this out, and that's why that question mark is in my title because we, you know, it's a relapse, uh, and and it's very dangerous, and 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 it, and it, you know, it'll take time to work its way out. I, I have every uh, firm conviction that it will work, but it's going to do enormous damage and is doing enormous damage uh, right now, this tendency to think in this way. So that's the first point that um, the emergence of the individual from the group, from the collective, is a long, long drawn out, intermittent and backsliding process, right? Uh, you don't you don't see it. I would think in those early groups, you tend not to see it even in existing groups that that you know have been discovered in the middle of Borneo or the Amazon jungle and so on. Uh, you tend not to see it even in, in the first empires, for example, in the Egyptian or the Mesopotamian. Again, here the idea is that your your constant, your almost your entire being is evacuated as it were by your membership of the group. It's extraordinary. If there, if there is, I mean, Hegel once said that in these societies, only one man is free, <laughs> and that's the king, the emperor, the pharaoh, whatever it might be. Uh, and I think there's a great deal of truth in what he says. And it takes a while, as it were, for it to uh, to percolate downwards. We begin to see it um, in sort of rudimentary form in something like Rome, where uh, with the rejection of the king um, and the institution of the dual consulship. And the idea of the limitation of terms, so that so you get the idea that uh, political power 
is important, obviously, if the if the if the community is to survive and flourish. But nonetheless, it must be extremely limited. And he had two rather than one, so the one person didn't get above himself, uh, and for a year only, so that you had a strict accounting. You had the same thing, by the way, in um, in Athens in a democratic phase, so called, where, and this I, I think I think any of your listeners will find this interesting. Almost all the political offices in the state were filled by lot. <laughs> right. The only ones that weren't were the 12 strategoi, those are the generals, in other words, in charge of the military, because here you need expertise. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no good asking your local butcher to suddenly lead the troops when he doesn't know the first thing about it, right? So you do need, you do need those guys to know what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And the other group, which weren't chosen by lot were the ambassadors. But everybody else was chosen by lot. And the idea was, and, and, by, and limited again for a year, and at the end of the year, there was a strict accounting. So the idea of a kind of permanent class like we have now, we think of ourselves as a great democracy, but if you think about it, we have people who are permanent politicians. They don't just turn up and do a job for a year or two years and so on, or even six. Mm -hmm. They can be there like Enda Kenny for 40 years and they're going, why don't you get a real job? <laughs> okay, okay, it's quite extraordinary. Okay, and we even get little dynasties, okay, where the son or the daughter, you know, gets it and so on. And it's quite extraordinary. We, we developed this kind of political class. And so you see that emerging, uh, even in Republican Rome, again, so that, you know, the among the, 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 the boni, the, the patricians, um, and they think they have this. And so they, all of the major offices are associated with them and there's a big there's a permanent tension in the Roman uh, Republic between the patricians and the plebeians and they're fighting it out and you know for power and so on and it's when we, we didn't get into all of that it's complicated and very interesting history but you see it working out um, but even there um, the idea of the individual is is hardly I mean, apart from the from the very well off and the patrician class it's hardly there it's like for example <laughs> at one stage, you know, you could you could be inducted into the Roman army and more or less forced to serve, not for a year or six months for a campaign, but like for 25 or 30 years. I mean, almost your entire life. Okay. And going, what's happening to the farm <laughs> back home? It's one of the things that led actually to the downfall of the Republic and the rise of the empire, but that's another story as well. So yeah, so those are those kinds of things. So that move from the collectivity, from the group to the individual, that's something, that's a permanent tension is a permanent feature of our history, okay? And not just our ancient history or even medieval history or even early modern history, but even of our history right now, even what's happening right now. And we saw in the 20th century, and I have a chapter on this in the book, the spectacular collapse into the collective in uh, three areas, in fascism, in Nazism, and then Bolshevism, mm -hmm. all forms of collectivism. I mean, most people probably don't think of it in these terms, but that's actually what it was, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the, this permanent, like, so the the worth and, and of the individual, the sacredness of the individual, is a delicate flower, right? And there's nothing to say that it cannot be, as it were, destroyed, covered over, uh, temporarily, or who knows if not permanently for long periods of time. It happened in the past, it's happened in the recent past. To some extent it's happening now and uh, we have to be permanently on guard against it. Yeah, I just want to uh, take, go on a little segue from there if we may. So yep. there you mentioned those three. We, <clears throat> we commonly understand that fascism and Nazism are bad, but yet we mm -hmm. see Marxism is treated more favorably and mm -hmm. neo-Marxism and so on. So this uh, collect collective mindset is considered okay, but the other two aren't. I want to hear your thoughts about this. I think um, Tom Holland, the popular historian, spoke about this recently, and he said that um, something along the lines of Nazism is obviously post-Christian and anti-Christian in the way it conducts itself, and it wants to trod down the weak and so on, whereas Marxism is more appealing, like a parasite on... Christian Judeo Christian civilization because it um, uses the terms of equality and justice and so forth and appeals to people more for that reason. It's kind of um, 
got a, 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 a different appeal. Does that make sense? Mm. And um, even yeah, no, yes. I mean, so uh, by the way, I don't want to be un- I don't want to be misunderstood uh, as saying that they're all equivalent in in all respects. They're clearly not, right? But they are equivalent in this respect that they're all forms of socialism. Mm-hmm. It's in the name. I'm not making it up. We talk about Nazis, right? But that's that's actually a term of abuse that's used by people who weren't Nazis. Okay. Uh, the the political regime in 1930s Germany was National Socialism, mm-hmm. and the party was the National Socialist Workers Party. <laughs> okay. yeah. Does that sound familiar? Okay. You might say, "Oh, it's not real socialism." But hang on a second. Yes. But it was. It involved the appropriation, uh, in in fact, if not in law, if I, it, sorry, uh, in fact, if not in law, of private property, so that the owners, for example, of factories became simply administrators under state control, right? Uh, and if you want to read the uh, political um, manifesto of the Nazi Party, I've got it in my book, and you re- and 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 somebody hadn't told you it was a Nazi. One, you would think this is a socialist, and it is. <laughs> yeah. forms. And of course, Mussolini was a socialist, yeah. right? And fascism is a form of socialism, but they're forms of national socialism. Now, of course, Bolshevism starts off with, with the idea of being, if you like, uh, universal and, and so on, but it quickly became national in the sense of Russian. And the whatever lip service were being paid to equality uh, and brotherhood and so on, uh, we quickly saw those subverted. I mean, so that it's like, let's all be equally desperate and poor and starving, okay? And, uh, you know, no one, no one is allowed, if you like, to call into question the, the activities of our leadership and so on. And the tale you're told, of course, is that this is simply a temporary stage until we reach the great kind of parousia when, when we will emerge uh, into a sort of stateless society. But somehow that seemed to be a very long time coming. And indeed... It never arrived. So the story you tell yourself is one thing, but you know, like anything else, when you want to know what somebody really thinks, you don't just listen to their words. You actually ask yourself, what are they doing? (laughs) Right. And so by by your deeds, you will know what they're doing. So all of those were forms of collectivism and everything was for the state. Everything was for the party, for the good of the party, uh, for the great and glorious dawn, which was to come, but which never came, uh, for the blood and soil of, of the of the fatherland, and so on for the restored Roman Empire a la Mussolini, which we you know was <laughs> which never sort of materialized. Uh, yeah, all of them. And by the way, all of these had support in their communities. Hitler was elected, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Frightening times. Um, yeah. yeah. We've we've just had an hour there, Jody. You okay to go for another while, or is that do you want to just go? Well, ahead? I don't know. We 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 can go maybe go a little while, but I I feel maybe I, this might be enough for for an intro, and then maybe no. we can, uh, in a future in a future chat, we can maybe get down to more specifics. 